Right, Marianne? Just take a deep breath and, and just experience the presence of God. That's what I want to just encourage us with this morning, and we see in the, in the book of Matthew, and we're going to be looking at the Gospels uh, and walking with Jesus and some of the stories surrounding the life of Jesus in the next couple of weeks together leading up to Easter. But when we look at, looking, look at the, uh, the Gospels, I'm going to be borrowing a lot of uh, the story of Matthew's view on the last couple of, of chapters of Matthew, but also looking at other Gospels uh, regarding the events of Christ and surrounding his life. So if you're there with me in Matthew chapter 26, stand with me for the reading of the word. One more time, if you'd stand. I also was told it's turkey season for a few weeks. How many hunters in the house? You enjoy... Uh, can you can you shoot geese? Is there a goose season ever? In uh, I love birds, and I wouldn't ne- really ever shoot a goose. So don't think I'm I'm don't I'm animal activist. I don't need any emails or phone calls. But um, we got we just got into our new house, and we're so excited about it. the Lord's blessed us with a home here in Rock Hill. And uh, it's like it's like the geese formed a V line formation and flew over our house and just bombed it like crazy. It looks like it snowed on our house, and I'm like, what happened? I was walking the dog this morning. I said, what happened to our house? It's just like, how do you wash that off the roof? I don't know, but it's, I hope it rains soon. So if there's goose season, give me a gun. I'm going after him. No, I'm season. Um, but I, just, I thank the Lord for the opportunity we have to experience his goodness to us. And if you're there in, in Matthew chapter 26, if you're there, say praise the Lord. I'm going to get there with you. And what, what I said earlier, the Holy Spirit's already preaching this word. Look at verse 6, if you will, with me. Verse 6 of chapter 26 of Matthew. While Jesus was in Bethany in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head and he, as he was reclining at the table. You guys see that? Verse 8, when the disciples saw this, they were indignant. And why this waste, they ask? This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. And where of this, Jesus said to them, why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel, this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. And it's interesting that Matthew, in this same context, immediately after that beautiful picture of worship with Mary and Jesus, He brings us to a place of almost an opposite thing happening in the heart of a man named Judas. Look what happens here. Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and asked, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? So they counted out for him thirty pieces of silver, and from then on Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Father, I want to thank you, Lord, for your word today. I ask, Lord, for the next few moments that your word, God, would be preached through these lips, God, in a way that, God, only you can. Lord, I pray that every heart in this place, every, the, all those watching online as well, God, would be open to what you want to say to them in this next few moments. Speak to us, Lord. Would you pray that right now? Speak to me, Father, in Jesus' name. And let your word be a lamp unto my feet and let it be a light unto my path. And I'll follow you hard all the days of my life. In Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. And amen. Give somebody a fist bump or a high five before you're seated. We're so glad you're with us. If this is your first time at Rock Hill First, we want to say welcome. And uh, you're part of our family. We just are glad you're here with us this morning. When uh, we love, we, you know, we, we talked about uh, our little Finley Michael. I, I love our, our grandson. He's our only grandson so far. We're, we're, we're believing we're going to have a lot more in the house at some point. But right now, he's our only one. And I love Finley, this age of three years. How many have you three-year-olds in the house? Anybody got three-year-olds in your home or grandkids at three years old in your home? You know how much fun they are, especially when you take them out in public. They're, they're not inhibited by anything. And Finley's always singing. We love that he's got this song in his heart all the time. He's always singing wherever we are. And a couple Christmases ago, even when he was, he was probably one and a half, two, it was about two then, I guess. And uh, he was, uh, we, we went to Hobby Lobby and they had these, he loves playing guitar. He loves, he grabs any kind of, he little play guitars, whatever. In Hobby Lobby, they had these little wall hanging guitars. And so he wanted to play every one of them. I'd pull it down and he'd, he'd put it around his shoulder right here and he'd hold on to it. And he began to sing Christmas songs. And he was, he was singing so loud that people in the aisles would stop by and just stop and watch. And then if they would leave, if nobody was watching, he'd go down to the end of the aisle to see if anybody was coming because he wanted to keep singing and get an audience. And I'm like, this kid, is, he's, he's just like, there's no fear in that kid to worship God. 
And the one thing I see when I read this story about Mary is that she was not inhibited one iota about who was in the room when she came to see Jesus and sit at his feet. And she was not inhibited. I want you to get that in your heart this morning. First of all, look at, look at chapter 26 again, if you will, the first part of that in verse 6. While Jesus was in Bethany in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar, a very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. She had to get to Jesus. She didn't care who was in the room. Hello? She wasn't, she wasn't inhibited. She wasn't embarrassed. She wasn't shy about it. She came in with that gift that she had, and she sat at his feet, and she said, here's my master, here's my savior, here is my Lord, and I'm going to worship him in that moment. She, she poured out this, this, this nard, this expensive perfume, if you will, and she said, this is, this, this is the finest thing I can bring to my Savior, to my Lord. Now, Jesus loved going to Bethany. He loved Mary and Martha. He loved Martha's cooking. That's why we got a Martha's kitchen. I love that team. That's my favorite team. And we, we've got a Martha's kitchen, and, we, and she loved, and he loved Lazarus. He loved going to Bethany and hanging out with us. He loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And so you see this story, this picture where he's hanging out with Simon the leper. He's in this place of, of, of just meeting with those who really need the help. And he's there for, for that. But Mary finds where he's at. She comes into the room and, and doesn't care who's in the room and begins to worship her Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, when you get truly saved and you fall in love with Jesus, you're not inhibited by what others think around you, about what circumstances in life, whatever's going on in your life. You're not, you're not concerned about that. You just want to get to Jesus and worship him no matter what. You say, Lord, I love you, and I worship you. I hate the enemy when he tries to tell you that you can't worship him because of what you did this week. Or how awful you are. How, how You messed up. You did this. You did that. You're not in right standing with God. Listen, when you come before the presence of God, when you come to Rock Hill first, I don't want you to be inhibited. I want you to come in here to declare the praises of the Lord and declare that he is King of kings. He is Lord of lords. He is the Alpha. He is the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He is the first and the last. He's my Savior. He's my King. He's my Healer. He's my Redeemer. He's my soon coming Lord. Hallelujah. And I'm going to worship him no matter what. You have to have a tenacity about you to worship him no matter what you've gone through. Some of you have been through some stuff. Some of you have been through some stuff. And some of you are going through some stuff right now. And the enemy would try to bring you to a place where circumstances are so heavy over you that you can't find a release in your heart to even say, thank you, Jesus, or praise the Lord, because you're, you're hurting so bad. And I'm encouraging you and imploring you to push through that and say, I'm going to kneel at his feet. I'm going to lay before his presence. And I'm going to say, God, I don't feel you. I don't sense you. I don't know what's going on in my life. But, Lord, I, I am going to worship you because of who you are. And that's what she did in that moment. It's a beautiful story, a beautiful picture of extravagant worship. She's uninhibited with the worship. She, she's coming before the Lord, and, she, and she's, de, she's determined to get to Jesus. I love that. Secondly, I also love that she's not, she's not just thinking about her own needs or what she's, uh, what she's coming and bringing before him, but she's worshiping Jesus solely on who he is. There's times in our lives where we have to come before the Lord. Maybe he hasn't answered a prayer the way we wanted him to answer it. Maybe he hasn't done what we thought he should do. Maybe, he's not, maybe we just feel like he's not seeing our need. But we have to say, Lord, in spite of how I feel in this moment, in spite of what my need is, I'm not coming to you because of what you can do for me. I'm coming to you because of who you are. Hallelujah. Look with me, if you will, later on in this, the next part of this in verse 8. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they ask? This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. And aware of this, Jesus said to them, why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. Everybody say beautiful thing. She has done a beautiful thing to me. And she's focused just on me. And it wasn't about, about her possessions or what she needed or what even that was worth. We are told that, that that bottle of perfume, that jar of alabaster jar of, of nard, was worth about a year's wages. In today's vernacular, that would be probably, what, forty to $50,000. Can you imagine? And here the disciples and those gathered as followers of Christ, those closest to him, didn't quite get it. 
And they're, they're, they're becoming, the, 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 the description there is indignant. They're, they're upset about her doing this. We, we think, think, think of all the things we could have done with that money. Think of all the things that we could have, we could have provided, what that could have provided for us. As, but Jesus said she has done, everybody say it with me, a beautiful thing. She's done a beautiful thing. Let me, let me encourage you, let me ask you this, when you worship Jesus, and many times when we worship God, when I say worship, it's a, it's a posture, it's a place where I say, Lord, I'm posturing myself, I'm humbling myself, I'm exalting you as my Lord and my Savior. But many times, let's be honest, many times when we're praising the Lord, when we're worshiping him, our hearts and our thoughts can go easily to, man, look at how God has blessed me. Look at my blessings, my possessions. Or it can go to, Lord, I'm going to worship you out of my need. Uh, you, you see what I need. I, I need. I need this in my life. I need, I need more income. I need a different job. I need, I need this to make me happy. I need this. And, I, and so we worship him out of our need. Right? It's getting quiet in here. Is that true for all of us? Some of us. Yeah, we go through that. I worship God out of my need. And, and that's okay. But listen, this is not where Mary was at. And this is not the example that I want to show us today. She didn't worship him because of what he could give to her or, or, what, she, or, or what she didn't have and she's bringing to him. She worshiped him with the best that she had, regardless of what he was going to do for her. He said, you are the Lord Jesus Christ. You are, you are my, my Savior. You're my Lord. And I'm going to worship you no matter what happens to me. No matter what I have, no matter what, I, what I'm in need of, I'm going to worship you just because of who you are. And she wasn't inhibited by, by anybody in the room. She loved on the Lord even though the, 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 those in the room were against what she was doing. And she wasn't coming to the Lord with, with her lack or with her amount of, of excess or possessions. But she was just simply saying, I'm going to bring my best worship to the Lord. I'm going to lay at his feet and I'm going to worship him. Hallelujah. Not inhibited. Let's read on. Let's read on. Jesus says, the poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. And when when she poured this perfume on my body, she she did to prepare me for burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. And here we see this. This, it's, like a, it's like a verses story. It's like it, here's the good and the bad in the middle of this. And Matthew does a beautiful job of portraying this. He says, Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and asked, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? So they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. And from then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. I've thought about the character of Judas many times when I, when I read this story. And I think, did this man have a choice or not? Was he in the middle of something he couldn't get out of? And I, I, I've talked with a, a scholar many years ago about this very issue, and I believe that for what I've come to understand, the way that I see Scripture, and the way I understand this, the character this, in this story of Judas, is that he was operating not necessarily out of, out of greed or out of a place of, um, of, a place of, of being, um, you know, wanting to bring harm really to Jesus. He wasn't, I think he was operating out of fear. He was operating out of a place of maybe I can help this and make it better. He didn't really understand the outcome of what was going to happen to Jesus. And so when he went to the religious leaders to hand Jesus over, we see that the enemy was involved in that. But at the same time, we see that, that Judas was operating in fear. I want you to know that when you're in the presence of the Lord and you truly get who he is and you're operating in a place of worshiping him because of who he is, there is freedom in that from fear. I mean, let, me, let me explain that a little bit. Earlier before this, we see that Jesus was asking his disciples, who do people say that I am? And, and the disciples are answering this question. And I love, I love what the disciples describe Christ. He says, you are the Messiah. Everybody say Messiah. He says, you are the Messiah. And in that moment, for the first time we see in Scripture where Peter is describing Jesus as the Messiah, he's, de- he's declaring that you are the one that we've been looking for. You are Jesus. You are King of kings, and you are Lord of lords, and you are the Messiah. Aren't you thankful that you've met the Messiah this morning in your heart? You are the Messiah, and he's declaring his lordship. He's declaring that you are the Savior of the world. And I believe that Mary got it. Look at your neighbor and say, she got it. She got it. I believe Mary got who Jesus was. 
And that's why she was uninhibited. That's, that's, that's why she was determined. That's why she was able to, to bring something that was very expensive and break it and, and anoint him. She realized, listen, when you need God more than anything else, there is nothing, no possession you have is worth keeping or saving from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? When you, when you are in need of God, when you're at a place of desperation in God, you just got to get to God. And no matter what he asks you to do, you say, Lord, I'm yours. And I believe Mary got it. What, I, what I'm fine, I'm marveled by is that when I look at the lives of these disciples, and it, some of them, it's like, you guys don't get it. You're concerned about this expensive jar of nard, yet here's Jesus, and you've only got a few days left with him, and, you're concerned, and they, just, they, they didn't get it. And Jesus, it's, it's almost like you can see him. I, I think that's why he loved going to Bethany. I think he just loved going, hanging out with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus so he could say, those guys, I tell you what, what am I going to do with those guys? And he would just kind of un, just unveil. But here he sees them again, and they're saying they're indignant about her breaking that bottle of nard, and, she, and they're saying, how could you do that? It's expensive. And, and, and Jesus is like, no, what she has done is a beautiful thing. A beautiful thing. And we see the outcome of Judas's decision to betray the Lord. And so we see the, uh, the, that play out in the garden. And we see later on where the, he was so troubled by that. He took the money back to the, the religious leader, leaders and threw it, threw it at, back at them. And then we see the demise of Judas's life and how that turned out. But what I want us to get this morning in these last few moments, and I'm going to have Annette just prepare, if you will, to, to come in just, a, in just a moment. What I want to get this morning in your heart is that Mary got it. She got who Jesus is. And I don't know where you're at with your walk in the Lord and those watching online. Listen to me just for a few more moments. I don't know where you're at, but I pray, it's my prayer that this Easter season, as we walk with Jesus, as we focus on the life of Christ, that you truly get who he is. For us and for me, the Lord has, has brought me to a place where there's a relationship. Everybody say relationship. There's a relationship with my Lord. It's not a thing that I, that I do it's not, a, it's, not a thing, it's not a ritual thing that I do. It's not something that is, I, I, it's not emotion. It's not a ritual in my life, but it's a relational place in my life where I've learned who Jesus is. And I'm still learning. And we see that in the Word of God. But let, let your relationship with the Lord be more than just emotion. Let it be more than just, just a, something that you do, a ritual that you work through, or just a discipline or a part of your life. Maybe if you punch the clock on Sunday or a Wednesday. Let your relationship be a place where you get who He is. And you love him because of who he is. And, and there's nothing that you have that, that is not his. I love what Jason said. What we have is what God gives us, and he supplies our needs. He supplies our tithe. He supplies our, our offerings. In a place of relationship with God, a place where he is, he is that Jehovah Jireh. He is that Jehovah Rapha. He is that Jehovah Roe that we've been talking about the last few months. He is that place where I know that if I, I've got to get to him. It doesn't matter what circumstances I'm going through. It doesn't matter who's in the room. It doesn't matter what other people think of me. Do you, do, are you more concerned about other people, what other people think of you other than getting to Jesus, or do you just want to get to Jesus? I just want to get to him. I want to know him. I want to know him. I want to know who he is. I want to, I want to get who Jesus is. And that's, I believe that's what Mary did. She, she got who he was. And she wasn't operating in fear, but she was pushing beyond fear. I've asked Annette to sing this song, and, and I believe in the next few moments as we just ponder what the Holy Spirit's been doing in this room today and how he's, how he's been ministering to us already and posture our hearts to find a true place of worship in him today as Mary did, sitting at his feet. And whatever that is in your life, maybe you've been holding on to something, you say, Lord, I'm, I'm giving this over to you today. I'm giving you myself today. I'm, I'm placing myself in the offering tray, if you will. I'm submitting my total life to you, every part of who I am. Maybe there's something in your life you're not, you're not so proud of. Maybe there's a, 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 a sinful habit or an or attitude that you, you, just, you feel like God needs to break in you or, or something that you've been fighting against or trying, to, trying uh, to shove out of your life. Let the Holy Spirit do the work today. You see, I love that when, when Mary was sitting at his feet, it wasn't so much an effort on her part to, to get the God's presence in response back to her. But Jesus was in the, he was, he was right there with her when she was anointing him, even so much so that he corrected those around him and said, no, what she's doing is a beautiful thing. You don't have to get God's attention by 
becoming critical, by, by becoming angry or become, becoming quiet on God, thinking that's going to work. That does not work. What works is faith. Everybody say faith. What works is faith. To get God's attention is your faith. That's what I'm asking you to do in, this, in the next few moments as we posture ourselves. I say, Lord, I'm coming to a place where I'm going to submit my life completely to you. Listen, in the next few moments, there's, there's somebody in the room today. You came today, and you didn't, expe- you didn't expect God to do this. But God is going to transform your life. Because what I see is that when you really get who he is, and you guys who know who he is, you're going you're gonna to understand this. When you really get who Jesus is, it will change everything about your life. Is anybody, any changed people in the room today? When you truly get who Jesus is, it will transform, it will change your life. It will change your outlook on life. It will change who you are as a person. All things are passed away. All things become new. Hallelujah. Come on, one more time. All things passed away. All things become new. Hallelujah. It transforms. When you really get who he is, it changes everything. Let's posture ourselves this morning.